Hey Bible fam, welcome to another installment in our Bible study. We are in the book of Romans. And just to recap, the book of Romans was written by Paul the Apostle to the church in Rome. And we noticed something very significant about the church in Rome. The church in Rome was not planted by any of the apostles. However, it was birthed from the Jews that came on the day of Pentecost, received the Holy Spirit, and then went back to Rome because they were living in Rome. And they started the church in Rome. The church in Rome is a mixture of the Jews and Gentiles. And now Paul writes letter a letter to them to help them navigate this aspect of Jews and Gentiles to help them navigate this walk now in Christianity and the first thing he addresses is the sin condition and we've been looking at that over the last two installments the sin condition that Paul identifies for the church in Rome to understand that they need salvation because they're coming out of a law-based culture they're coming out of a work-based culture to now understand Greece they're also merging different cultures together when we speak about their religious backgrounds and he addresses the aspect of condemnation that the Jews may want to feed, um, throw onto the Gentiles because they serve idols, because they come from um, paganistic cultures, because they come from that space of uh, um, homosexuality as well and we dealt with these topics and definitely if you miss any of that what you can do is you can go to our YouTube channel, you can click under the videos tab or you can check under the playlist tab and look for the book of Romans and check out those first couple of installments that we We've already covered the background, the context, and some main sin aspects that Paul identifies and deals with. In today's study, we are going to be finishing Romans chapter 2, and we may touch on Romans chapter 3 depending on how our study goes today because Romans chapter 2, even though we just have a few verses left from verse 25 to verse 29, it's certainly a lot to unpack when it comes to these few verses. So grab your Bible so that you can follow along and grab a notepad so that you can take some notes. If you have not done it as yet, hit that share button, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Let's jump into the, today's study. So we're in the book of Romans and we're looking at verse 25. And here's what Paul says. Now remember, he's speaking to the Jews here and he wants to address certain separation there, are, there may be as well within the church community because remember they are the Jews and they are the Gentiles and one of the big issues that come to the forefront that can cause a lot of separation within the church is this aspect of circumcision right because remember the Jews under the Abrahamic covenant had to go through this process of circumcision which was meant to be the covenant between the Jews and God right between the lineage of Abraham and God now Abraham would have been the first one to partake in circumcision and his son Isaac and then all of his um, servants as well and then all of his generations afterwards the, the males would practice circumcision and now Paul is addressing this aspect of circumcision and he says for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law now he's not negating the value of circumcision He's saying that it does have value. However, he's going to point us to something that is of greater value than circumcision. Now, I want you to understand in context that for the Jews, circumcision was a big deal. Now, if you had to, as a grown man, get circumcised, you could understand that this would be a big deal. Imagine you had to go through the torture of circumcision, and now that was the way that you were taught that through circumcision, you are now in covenant with God. Now, there's a new covenant now altogether in Christ where you don't have to be circumcised to be part of that covenant because the covenant is made through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, imagine the <laughs> jealousy. Imagine the feeling of uh, these people didn't really do any kind of work because I had to go through this pain and agony of circumcision to be now God's chosen people. And now there's these Gentiles that are coming in and they're not circumcised. And, and now for the Jews as well, circumcision also represents a sense of being unclean physically. It also represented a sense of not really uh, making that sacrifice as a, as a person to be part of the chosen people of God. So there's this big separation. Now you could understand if you were circumcised um, and now there are people coming in to follow God that did not have to go through that pain that you had to go through, you would feel as though they have it easy and as well they are unjustified because they didn't do anything majorly sacrificial to now become part of the body of Christ. So here's what he's saying to them. For circumcision indeed is of value because he wants to break down this religious mindset as well that the Jews would have 
when it comes to their works, right? He's tackling the works, first of all, as he transitions into grace. So he's identified the sin nature in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2. He's now identifying the works nature that is heavily abundant in the Jewish people. Now, you may be thinking as Christians that we don't need to worry about this works-based nature. However, it is always easy to fall into this works-based nature. It is always easy to start justifying our righteousness based on our works because it is our human nature because works and pride is tied together and pride comes before a fall. And if we're not careful, we can start becoming proud because of the works that we do, right? And when other people aren't doing that level of work that we have done to the level of sacrifice that we've made to follow Christ, we can start now doing the same thing that the church in Rome was doing. They start separating the Gentiles from the Jews saying, hey, you haven't worked as hard. You haven't done enough. You were not circumcised. And Paul is saying, hey, okay, the circumcision has value. What you did is valuable. You being circumcised, I do not um, negate the value of that. I don't negate the value of your sacrifice, of your hard work. I don't negate that value. However, it is only a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcised. Now, <laughs> I don't know about Paul, right? But there's no way that your circumcision could become uncircumcised. Like, you can't fix that. That, that go on, right? There's no way to restore your circumcision. But what he's saying metaphorically is that the purpose of you being circumcised now because of, becomes of no value if you are circumcised, but then you aren't actually following the law of God. In other words, it serves no value if you are circumcised, right? You did some big work for God. You know, you're, you're preaching, you're teaching, whatever it may be, right? You're serving in the, in the church community, right? It's, it's of no value if you are circumcised. You've done work. However, you are actually not living in right standing with God. You are actually living in sin behind closed doors. So he says that um, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. In other words, your works are useless if your relationship with God isn't right. And we'd even see Jesus saying that many would stand before him saying, I've done this in your name. I've, I've cast out demons. I've preached sermons. I've done evangelistic work. I've traveled throughout the world. I feed the poor. I did all these things in, in Jesus' name. And Jesus would say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I know you not. Why would he say that? He would say that because people would, there was a lot of people that do work, but actually don't have relationship with God. Um, they do work for the fame for the accolades, for the pride that comes with it, for just being in a church community, being, being seen as that, in that place of power and authority and influence. And they are so driven by the wrong motives that they actually don't have relationship with God. And behind closed doors, they're actually living in sin. Behind closed doors, they are actually not following the law of God or the precepts of God. They're actually not be a, a true follower of Jesus Christ. And he's saying now to the Jews that if you break the commandments, then your circumcision is basically of no value. Now it has value, your works have value. However, if it is that you are not in a good relationship with God, you're not actually serving God from your heart, you're not actually living a holy life, then now your works become of no value. It is better that you were not circumcised. So in verse 26, he says now, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Now, this is going to upset the Jewish community, right? Because Paul is saying to them, hey, the Gentiles that are coming in now, if they are actually keeping the law of God, they are equated to you when it comes to the sacrifice of circumcision. Like, wow. Now, you must understand, as a Jewish reader, this is going to be highly offensive. Because you were circumcised. Any grown man that had to be circumcised, you would be extremely offended if Paul is now telling you, hey, there are new people coming into the church community. They don't have to be circumcised if they are following the law of God. That is of equal value as your circumcision. And he's saying now, for the Gentiles that are coming in, um, into the church of Rome, and they are uncircumcised, right? If they are following the law, then it comes as though they are circumcised. Now, don't get tied up by the actual circumcision. What is valuable here is not the circumcision, but the covenant. Because what circumcision represents is the covenant between God and Abraham. That Abraham now and his generation are God's chosen people. He will bless them. He will multiply them. They would be an example to the nations, right? This is the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And what Paul is saying is that if the Jews um, are, are circumcised and they're not following the law of God, they basically lost out on the covenant. And he's also saying 
for the Gentiles that are coming in, they don't have to be circumcised to be under the Abrahamic covenant. In other words, they will be blessed, they will multiply, they would be an example to the nations. They would show forth the glory of God upon the face of the earth. Why? Because they are following the law of God and they are now under the new covenant grafted into the body of Christ. Now, he hasn't covered as yet the new covenant. And we will get into that as we move into the book of Romans, talking a little bit more about the new covenant versus the old covenant. But he's really speaking about circumcision. And this is what circumcision represents, the old versus the new covenant. So then in verse 27, he says, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written the code on circumcision but break the law. <laughs> Ooh, imagine that. Imagine he's saying to these Jewish people that the uncircumcised Gentiles can now condemn you, right? Basically, they can now tell you you are living in sin even though you are circumcised because you are breaking the law, right? This is like if you are part of a church community, you've been a senior um, leader in the church for many, many years, and then somebody new comes into the church community, they just got saved, they just got baptized, they start reading God's word and they start living for God, and then they start telling you, hey, I see you are living a lifestyle that is opposite to what the Bible says, right? This is what he's saying, that it doesn't matter the circumcision, it doesn't matter the work that you've done, you must always remain true to God's word, right? And true to living according to the law of God. So then in verse 28, he says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. Praise is not from man, but from God. So let's just unpack these verses, right? He says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. Now, this is really interesting because for the Jewish community, circumcision was meant to be an outward thing, right? It's a physical act of, um, that, that, is, that is on your outward appearance to show that now you are circumcised. But the, the thing about circumcision is that this is a private part of your body. So it's not like something that is written on your forehead that everybody's going to see or on your hand, etc. While it is meant to be outward, it is still private when you think about it, right? Circumcision is still private even though it's outward. So, I mean, people will know you are circumcised. You will tell them you're circumcised. But it's not something that you go walking down in the market street, you're walking through the streets of Rome and all the Gentiles like, oh, I see his circumcision. No, there's no way to really tell if you are circumcised, right, from the view of the general public. But what circumcision does is for the person themselves, they are now seeing this outward thing that reminds them that they are the chosen people of God. And what he's really tackling here when he speaks about circumcision is that you could do things, right, that not even everyone sees, but in your mind, you start justifying yourself, right? You start justifying um, how chosen you are, or you start justifying and pride starts coming in for things that aren't necessarily public, but for you, it's a form of self-righteousness. And that's what, at the end of the day, circumcision became to the Jews. It became a form of self-righteousness. Not necessarily that everybody knew, and yes, they would boast in it, everybody would know that they're circumcised, but more so, it is something that they personally would have been convicted of by seeing their circumcision and saying, I did the work, I deserve this, all right? And if we're not careful as the church, we could be just like the Jews in that aspect that we start looking at all the things we've done internally. Like the world doesn't see it, right? Um, the world doesn't even validate it because it's not really making a big impact in our world. But we can start validating it internally and start becoming proud internally. So we've covered a certain amount of attendance for the year or we've covered a certain amount of hampers for the year. We've, uh, we've helped so many people in need this year. And while those are good things, we can start becoming proud of these things internally, even though they're not making a, a large impact in the world that we should be living in. Because if we're not careful, we could become just like the Jews, where um, everything is about what is within the walls of the church. 
and that church community are not actually being salt and light in the world outside of the church community, which is what the Jews were meant to do. And this is what Jesus now is trying to get the church to start doing. When he, um, and this is what Paul is trying to help them to understand as well. That is more than just the inward circumcision um, in terms of your physical body, but it's more a heart condition. And he says to the Jews, your outward or physical appearance does not qualify you, but instead, it is the inward circumcision that matters, the circumcision of the heart. So a different type of circumcision, right? So they would have, in the Old Testament, they would have circumcised physically. Um, they, they, they would circumcise physically or outward um, circumcision. Now Paul is saying that the circumcision of the heart is more important. And what does the circumcision of the heart mean? Circumcision under the Jewish law was meant as a purification process. It was meant of that place of sacrifice, Right? It was first done by Abraham entering into covenant with God. Now, what, God, what um, Paul is saying to his audience is that circumcision must not just be an outward thing. You can get circumcised, you cannot get circumcised, it does not matter. Right? It will not change anything under the new covenant. However, if you are not inwardly circumcised, if there is not a purification of your heart, if there is not a cutting off, of the old ways, if there's not a cutting off of who you used to be, if there's not this purification and this sanctification from the person you used to be into the person that is more in the image and likeness of God, then you have failed in the response of what it means to be a Christian or the response unto the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, right? So he's saying that there must be a circumcision in the matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And this is very important for us to understand. Because when we speak about um, circumcision of the heart um, versus circumcision of the body, circumcision of the body was meant to be by a physical means. You would physically circumcise. Now, when we speak about the Holy Spirit being poured out, and we speak about what God does inwardly, we are not depending on our own strength or our own ability to for that circumcision or that purification of our heart. Instead, we are allowing the Spirit of God to do what He has to do in our life. And what I want to say to, to you that are viewing right now is oftentimes we could actually be fighting against the Spirit of God. Because the thing is that once the Spirit of God comes into our life, He starts that cleaning up process, right? He starts that purification process. It, because it's not based on our works. Like, we don't become more like Christ based on our inward works. The Holy Spirit starts working inwardly on us, and that shows outwardly in how we work, right? And what we do. But a lot of us actually fight the Holy Spirit by trying to make ourselves righteous on our own. Let me repeat that. A lot of us fight the Holy Spirit by trying to make ourselves righteous. Circumcision under the law was you making yourself righteous by doing this process. Under the new covenant, when the Holy Spirit comes in, he starts making you righteous. This is what Paul is saying. It's a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So God himself, the Holy Spirit, comes inside of you and he starts that cleaning up process. It is not under your works that you clean yourself up. And there's a big misconception in the church that you need to clean yourself up. You need to break your ha bad habits. No, you just need to allow the Holy Spirit to have more of you and stop resisting the Holy Spirit by trying to do the work on your own. Trying to do the, the cleaning up on your own. Trying to do the purification on your own. No, let the Holy Spirit do what He is fully equipped to do and then he would be the one that get praised. So you're not going around now boasting, hey, I did it. I cleaned myself up. I break this bad habit. I do that. I do that. No, instead it is, I didn't, I didn't have the ability of my own. I lacked the strength. But the power of the Holy Spirit did something for me that I could not do on my own. Right? And then Paul closes off this chapter by saying, God will receive the glory, not man. Right? Which brings us to the end of Romans chapter 2. Like I told you, those few verses was a lot to unpack when it comes to um, circumcision and when it comes to that circumcision now of the heart that we are called to as the church of Jesus Christ. And we will continue into our next installment in Romans chapter 3. And I want you to be prepared, continue reading ahead. I know we are moving through these verses in a slow pace because there's a lot to unpack, but you could continue to read ahead as we go along and then come back and review as we cover different passages, right? Um, just remember that this Bible study is on our YouTube channel as well as Facebook. And if you have not done it as yet, hit that share button, hit that like button, and hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much for viewing. If you have any comments, you can leave it in the comment section. Criticism is welcome as well. God bless you.